Good afternoon, Salam, uh, Excellency Professor Mohammed Banias, Director, Commission of Accreditation, UAE Minister, Ministry of Education, Higher Education Affairs, Professor Sang Don Wong, Secretary General, Silk Road Universities Network, Mr. Chalubi Lee, Vice President, LG Electronics, Dr. Ayman. Irbad, head of ICT department, Hamdan bin Khalifa University, Qatar. Professor Adel Ben Menowar, Canadian University, Dubai. Esteemed trustees and governors, excellencies, chancellors, vice chancellors, presidents, noble faculty staff, guests, and proud students. On behalf of the Canadian University Dubai, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the opening of the seventh annual conference of the International Association for Silk Road Studies under the theme, the roles of universities in, era, in the era of artificial intelligence and big data challenges and opportunities. Though we cannot yet meet in person, we are honored to host this event from Dubai which is a strategic crossroads on this Silk Road map. Dubai is a diverse and multicultural city that embodies the spirit of the Sun Network to promote cooperation, coexistence, and co-prosperity. I am sure you will experience this in your interactions throughout the conference. Over the coming weeks and months, we will convene regularly to hear from academic and industry experts on some of the biggest challenges and opportunities emerging in artificial intelligence and big data in various fields of study. We have all experienced a transformational technological journey in the past two years. Moreover, in this digital era, this digital age, we are all witnessing the impact of emerging transformations in all sorts of related fields, engineering, healthcare, communication, finance, management, transportation, architecture, et cetera, et cetera. In our day-to-day -day undertakings in higher education, we are already validating or experimenting with many of these innovations, including smart interactive classrooms, systemic administrative tasks, targeted student recruitment, analytic student conversion, fully integrated student admission and registration processes and systems, enhance, enhancing the retention rate, assessment methods, grading systems, and around the clock access to learning, facilitating a global access. This conference will allow us to share insights and exchange ideas to identify innovative solutions and best practices and to explore new frontiers in the application and advancement of AI and big data in higher education. Through multidisciplinary debate, we have the opportunity to promote better understanding of the current issues in these fields and bring forward new ideas to build the principles and the practices of the future. I really hope that you will find the program of events both engaging and informative. Thank you once again for joining us and I wish you an enjoyable and enlightening conference. Thank you. Our next speaker for today is Dr. Sungdon Huang, who is the Secretary General of the Silk Road University Network. Dr. Huang is a professor at the University of Hankook's Department of Public Administration, which specializes in international studies. Uh, dear my friend and colleague, Dr. Karim Kelly, who as the president of Canadian University of Dubai, is co-hosting with me this conference. Professor Mohamed uh, Banias, Director of CAA, Ministry of Education of UAE. Professor Adel Ben Manawar, who as the President of the International Association for Silk Road Studies, is organizing this conference. Mr. Tolbe Lee, Executive Head and the Corporate Vice President of LG Electronics, who is presenting an industrial showcase today. Professor Ayman Erbad, Head of Information and Computing Technology of Ahmad bin Khalifa University, Qatar, who will give us a special lecture. 
today and distinguished fellows, sirs, and ladies and gentlemen participating in this historic event from all over the world. The International Association for Silk Road Studies, what, you, what we call EAS, was born in 2015 at the inaugural General Assembly of the Silk Road Universities Network as an academic body of sun. EAS was founded with a humble goal as the ancient Silk Road served for nourishing the civilizations it grow well as an intellectual crossroad upon which diverse ideas, thoughts, research, findings, knowledge, skills, and technologies, peaceful coexistence and co-prosperity along the Silk Road and meet and exchange together without any economic, political, and cultural biases. Since then, EAS has held the International Academic Conference annually with diverse themes related to this goal. As we, we all notice, participants in this conference are diverse in terms of religion, region, culture, and field of studies. They are so prominent scholars who are leading their fields of study. Papers to be presented are of high quality, filled with original, authoritative, and innovative ideas about the application of AI and big data. It is against this background that I am grateful to, in this conference, as paper presenters, panelists, showcase presenters, and keynote Lecture. Lastly, there are many people who have been working for this conference behind the scene. I'd like to ask for your big hand to appreciate the hard work of the coordinators of Sun Secretariat for making the conference a successful one. Thank you, indeed. Congratulations again for the wonderful start of the conference and thank you all. Um, thank you, Dr. Huang, for delivering us with the congrat congratulatory speech. Our next speaker for today is Dr. Adel bin Manawa, who is a president of EAS 2022 and a professor in the Faculty of Engineering, Applied Science and Technology Department at Canadian University, Dubai. His Excellency Muhammad Banias, Dr. Muhammad Banias, Director of the CIA Ministry of Higher Education, UAE, Mr. Chalbe Lee, Vice President of LG Electronics, distinguished guest speaker, Dr. Ayman Arbad, and honorable audience. Now, on behalf of the organizing committee of the IASS and on behalf of the Canadian University of Dubai community, it's a pleasure and a source of pride for me to welcome you all today to the seventh occurrence of the annual International Academic Conference of the International Association for Silk Road Studies IS 2022, that is held under the theme, the role of higher education in the era of artificial intelligence and big data, challenges and opportunities. The theme actually highlights the current huge impact of AI and big data on different disciplines, emphasizing the challenges and opportunities these technologies present to the higher education sector. That needs to reassert its role in empowering upcoming student generations with these tools of knowledge that are necessary for achieving excellence. Today, we have the privilege of welcoming Mr. Charles Bay Lee, Executive Head of and uh, Corporate Senior Vice President of Life Innovation Design Centers at LG Electronics INC, who will be presenting the showcase session, Shifting in a New Era, living with AI and metaverse. This is be highlighting the impact of AI and augmented technology and augmented reality, basically, and the digital presence on our social life on the internet and outside. Uh, then we will be honored with the keynote speech of Dr. Uh, Ayman Arbad, Associate Professor and Head of the Information and Computing Technology at Hamad bin Khalifa University, Qatar. Finally, I would like to sincerely thank all the members of the OC and SC committee and to the support team, especially Ms. Perry for the hard work and dedication they did 
to get this event up to the stage. Now, with no further dues, I will like to, I mean, free the floor for the next two presenters. And I uh, declare the seventh annual international conference, academic conference of the International Association for Silk Road Studies, IS 2022, officially open on this day of February 22nd, 2022. Wish you all enjoyable moments ahead. Thank you very much for your virtual presence and attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Manawar, for delivering us with the opening speech. Our next speaker for today is Mr. Chul Bay Lee, who is a Corporate Senior Vice President, Executive Head of Life Innovation Design Center at LG Electronics. The title is Living into AI, AI and Metaverse. Let me talk about the, the AI things. If you recall the robots or AI in the Western movies, especially American movies, they are quite frightening. The, at the end of the movie, the robots and AI are thinking that human is obsolete, useless. So let's wipe it out. So they are trying to kill us all, something like that. So it's kind of dystopian things. If you see the Japanese movie, like uh, Astro Boy, or Doraemon, those cute robots, they are robots actually. They are the creator of the Astro Boy wanted to take him, the Astro Boy, to be a son, his son. And if you see the, the tale of Pinocchio, so Pinocchio has been the, acting as the, the grandson of the grandfather, and Pygmalion and Galatea, the miss, the, the Sculpture created the, the, the sculpture and it is so beautiful. So he prayed that it, it, it's turning to be a human and falling in love <laughs> with the lady. Yeah. So the story is that the breathing the life into the human the created object, this is the dream of AI and, and the robotics. The human being are trying to create like a lifelike creature with the AI and the mechan mechanical uh, objects. I'm a designer. We, especially as electronics, are creating appliances. And if I ask the appliance designer, what, what do you do? They are saying that I'm creating like a furniture type of the appliances. If I ask the, the furniture designer what you are creating, he, will be typically, he or she will be typically saying that we are creating a space. And if I ask the space design or architect what you are creating, they are, they are saying that, oh, I'm, I'm creating part of nature. This is the sequence. So there's a appliances, furniture, furniture designers are trying to create a space, space designers are trying to create a nature. Actually, nature has been created by the God <laughs> and God created the human as an imperfect existence. So human beings need to live together, helping each other. And AI resembles human being. So the AI actually resembles the imperfection of the human being as well. So human being and robot and AI, they need to be a social existence, meaning that they need to have a relationship building capability as well as the nice personality. Without those, they cannot live as a social existence. Now let's think about the AI and what, what will be the impact of the AI. Actually, if our actual mathematicians, statistic the researchers in, in our lab, actually they, they analyze, analyze all the productivity data of the the UK, United Kingdom, since 1272 up to date. And if it's a graph, there's a point, the inclination of which is dramatically changing. We call it the inflection point. So around the 1720, there has been 25% of the dramatic increase of the productivity. So at the time, the production amount has been growing. And 1795, 29%. So 
the inclination dramatically changes and so on. So we found out the seven main inflection point and the productivity acceleration will be dropped down with the Irish War of Independence in UK because it, this is UK data and Great Depression from America made the economic growth to be a little bit to slow down and Second World War as well. So if we zoom in into this area, there will be three industrial revolution period. So first inflection point was here, and nearby that incident, the steam engine has been the invented. So the power has been applied to the production cycle. And in 1784, first mechanical loom to make a fabrics has been developed actually invented and there's a second inflection so the actually industrial revolution number one was the powered production and industrial revolution number two was the with the emergence of the conveyor belt the production the acceleration has been jumped up and 1969 <coughs> first programmable logic computer has been developed for the automation of the production line. And there is a third inflection point. So second industrial revolution was due to the conveyor belt, uh, mass production. And third was the uh, due to the information. And if you see the, the labor productivity index, it's along with the, the productivity acceleration. Let's go to the next slide. These days, through the American eco economic the, the recession through the, due to the, the Lehman Brothers in 2008, the, our economic uh, development was slowed down. So less than 10 years of the acceleration of the productivity is lower than that of the sum of the less than 100 years, which means that this is the greatest the recession in the econ economic development in our history, industry history. But while in this kind of the deep the recession, annual investment of the AI in the Silicon Valley area has been dramatically jumped up like a J curve, which means that if this curve of the productivity acceleration is revitalized, maybe they are anticipating that this AI sector will be the driver for this uh, revitalization. So our mathematician uh, applied a Holtz forecasting methodology to forecast when will be the next inflection point. But this research has been done in 2000, uh, 2018. So at the time, it is 2027, that may be pushing power of this revitalization will be AI, big data, robotics, and now metaverse from the last year. But due to the coronavirus, the world economy has been recessed further. So our mathematician put another data with the economic recession. So we predicted that maybe 2.66 year delayed. So 2029 more so, we will have a revitalization of the economies. So this acceleration the inflection point of the productivity will be revitalized with these area. So AI related area like AI big data robotics and now metaverse is the key like a focus area for our company as well. This is interesting the chart. For instance, the flush toilet. This is the penetration rate. So started from 1860. The penetration rate of the almost 100% in Western area, Western countries were 19, mid, mid 1980s. And if you see the mobile phones here, the mobile phone, the 1993 or five, they started and it was like a J curve. Within the two decades, the saturation rate was jumped almost 100%. And interesting thing is that Physical labor, which is typically eight hours a day at home, it's like a chore things. 
the physical labor has been dropped down to the, the almost two hours a day, but it's not decreasing further with this kind of the, the many convenient product appliances supplied to the market the actual physical labor time is not decreasing anymore but there will be like an ai technology emergence and what the ai will be helping us we are expecting that uh, rather than just the physical labor it will have to decrease the cognitive labor after 2027 for instance imagine 1990s if you put if you are trying to purchase a car even in Korea, there will be maybe four or five choices. That's all. So in accordance with your wallet, you can choose whatever car you can afford. But these days in Korea, there are several tens of, of the choices. So it's, it's really hard to make a choice. If you are to buy a washing machine as of today, you have to choose out of maybe 20, 30 options. But two decades ago, there were three or four options. So our cognitive, cognitive labor has a big burden. We need to search every single site and compare the specification, which is a little hard job. Maybe AI in the future, AI-related technology, will contribute us to decrease the burden of the cognitive, cognitive labor rather than the physical labor, that's our forecast. And robots. So many people, including edge electronics, are developing many type of robots. If you see this graph, here's the robotics, like a mechanical things. Here's the intelligence, which is the thinking power. If there's a robot with a very high intelligence, with no robotics, mechanical things, this will be like a Watson. Or if the, if the robot has the very complicated, sophisticated robotics, but no brain at all, this is like an intuitive Da Vinci, the operation robot for the human surgery. The, it's exactly working as the doctor indicated. So Da Vinci, do not make a judgment. Only the human being, doctor, make a judgment and the cut and, and sew something. So if you go here, maybe we can have a very high intelligence with the high precision robotics could be here. But why we are not focusing this area? Many of the robot expert, experts said that it's too dangerous. Imagine that Da Vinci, like, surgery robot is doing their own judgment and they are doing operation by themselves. Maybe we'll be a little bit terrified. So this will take some time. Anyway, by the classification of the robot, this is called assistant robot, like a Google Assistant or Amazon Alexa. And finally, it will be like a Watson. And this is production robot, productivity robot. So these robots are doing what they exactly asked to do. But this kind of relationship robot, relation, relational robot, is a typical robot in the movies, like AI. This is a robot, and it's a son. And uh, this robot is trying to make a relationship with a human being, champion as well. So relational robot will be the future of our robots. Nowadays, robot and AI are focusing either in assistance or productivity or toys. There are many robots in the market, from the famous Moxie educational toy, and Jibo, which has been bankrupted, and many other toys like this. And Ibo is another great achievement from the Sony, the pet robot. And there is, okay, Pepper was a good achievement as well. So there are many robots. We, we cannot even remember how the, the exact feature and the name of the robot. And where is it? Uh, okay. 
Yeah, Starship. This is the very famous delivery robot. So we classify the, the robots. Uh, maybe some of the robots are focusing on the emotive things. Some of the robots are cognitive things. And some of the robots are focusing on the sensors and doing some physical chores as well. And the blue dot has been like a commercialized, like a LG Chloe. And uh, this, the, like a sky blue dot has been like a dropped and others are just research robots. Certainly, LG also made the made a like a research logo like this. So it was wandering around the home, and it can do many jobs like a surveillance with a camera and controlling the air conditioner or detecting the bad gas, something something like that. Or it can talk to the the owner and you can play with the pet. And a little bit more advanced, like it's imitating the human neck movement. So it's asking questions and reserving the tickets for the movie. So it's a little bit more emotive. The development was started from this the cardboard, cardboard the prototype. So we tried to embed like uh, emotive things. We research the, all the emotions and we developed the several scenarios for this. And we eventually did the exhibition at the South by Southwest at Austin in 2020. And we developed the uh, siblings, like a uh, gesture lover. And we did the exhibition at the South by South like this. And this AI is tightly tied with the, the future autonomous vehicle. So uh, as a business, LG are trying to develop a lot of the infrastructure for the autonomous vehicle and the interior cabin as well. We started from the personal mobility like this. Like uh, this is a small, very small personal mobility, which can learn in the bike lane. And the connected car, uh, vision uh, exhibited at the CES in Las Vegas in 2020, and we showed off uh, many of the scenario like this. This is actually a picture taken in the car of the connected car. So we can take some. Uh, this is a new vision, but uh, we can take some food in the autonomous car. This is the the car buck, collaboratively fabricated with the Hyundai Motor Company, and we are trying to. Activities at the Geneva Motor Show, but because of the coronavirus, we couldn't make it. And I will show the, the Omnipod vision later. This is the our newest creation. We are trying to exhibit this at the CS of this year, but we called it off. So we made an online exhibition. But I will talk about this car after the metaverse session because it's connected with the metaverse as well. But anyway, it is equipped with the the like a champagne of the beverage refrigerator like this. And here, underneath of the seat, there's a huge styler like this. And here, there's a styler for the, the garment here, like this. So there are many convenient uh, the, the accessories inside and there are many the content features I'll show later. And the metaverse, uh, metaverse is like an internet. We are starting era of the, the metaverse. If I get back to the, the 30 years ago, 1990s, maybe we should have started internet portal company or searching engine company with the advertisement. And maybe we could earn uh, much more money than this typical the manufacturing business. So what if, if we call back 
30 years later, go back this year, 2022, this is very beginning era of the metaverse. So maybe we need to invest something. So we are creating many the business models and service model for this. And the layer, the meanings of which is the, the ch child from the future we have created as a 3D rendering, it's a leaked rendering. So our computer can control the 3D, the image of the, the face as if the, the meta human creator from the Unreal. And we have uh, the defect technology and so on. So we are trying to create a virtual human so then maybe at the front desk of the hotel or bank, maybe this kind of the virtual human can do some kind of the welcoming job for the guest, then we can save some money. So for the Leia Kim, we created the Instagram account uh, the two years ago. So we did some kind of posting like this and we, we created the history of our own. And there's a the metaverse platform called Jepeto in Korea, uh, the, driven by neighbor. It's it's pretty big one. But by creating a special cartoon character, so-called Love is G from Instagram, we launched a special service at the the Jepeto. But Jepeto is basically playground for the the young people. So they are just spending time and visiting places there. So it's not commercial place, but the, there's a many hidden business model here. So we are trying to create our own as well, maybe personal space, we can install our products there, we can control LG product from the personal space. For docking space, there'll be shopping room or, or shopping mall or the working office so that we can do have this kind of conference and we can do our work as well. Or online offline activities like a gaming or camping, we can do it virtually. But other than that, what kind of the metaverse experience in the real life could be? Imagine that this is the, the bathroom. So there's a atmosphere display, whatever it's LED or projection. There's a background image with a special aroma so that we can feel that we are having a bath at the Turkish the hot spring. Or what if? So over the wall, the, the on other side of that wall, that's the living room of my daughter's house. So that entire wall will be turning into a screen and we can greet to each other as if over the, the glass there's a the, there's my daughter and grand grandson. So we can we can have this kind of the the metaverse scene. And even with the existing conventional of the object, we can map the image on top of that as, as if it, it's AI projection mapping. So this is the South by Southwest at the Austin. This is conventional clock, but there's a projector and projector is projecting the mapping image on top of, on top of the clock. So it's displaying the clock or time related uh, information and image. It, it, it's creating nice mood. So this kind of the mapping type of the the augmented reality and metaverse will be pretty the popular in the future as well. This is a picture. And what if the screen is installed into like a home or public transportation or event? For instance, this is the small prototype of the subway, the metro in Korea. What if uh, there's a array of the screens in the ceiling of the metro so that actual imagery of the outside of the metro system is projected here as if we are running in the bus. And there could be some kind of the advertisement on top of that. And we have uh, the ARQ, AERQ, which is joint venture with Lufthansa Technique. So we are creating a lot of the displays for the air cabin experience. So what if we can project or we can install OLED screen in the ceiling of the 
uh, air cabin so that we can create a special image like that, as if we are flying in the, the space. Or in the gallery area, we can put some screen and uh, projecting the image of the preparation of food. So how chef has been preparing your food for the in-flight in food. Well, with the curved the display, we can do nice in-flight entertainment as well. So this is the Omnipod we recently created. This is a basically car, but if you park this car beside your home, you can have an extra space attached to your home. So we call it another home. For instance, if I do like a conference call with a video call, WebEx call, or if you play your guitar, or you can sing along, you can listen to the, the music pretty loud, uh, loud volume, you can do it in the car as if it is a part of your house. So, so Kakao T Mobility is a famous the Uber-like service in Korea. So we jointly developed this service in the, for the future. So if you call a fitness-enabled car, the car will be arriving soon. That car is a self-driving autonomous vehicle. So it will be arriving in front of your house like this. And if you go into the car, there's a layer, but the cartoon version. So it's She's a fitness coach. So during your stay in the car, you can do some exercise with her. And I can change my clothes with the sweat. And this is another mode. This is immersive theater because this car is surrounded with a screen. You can do like a AR or VR type of the movie watching. And you have a virtual shopping, metal shopping here. So you can indicate your food and you can order food. And the campfire, you can park the car alongside the, with the sea and you can do some the camping as well. As you see here, the many of the metaverse things are being done in the headset, whether it's AR or VR headset. But our vision is to expand the VR or AR vision to the, the larger screen, like a transparent OLED or 55 or 65 inch screen or entire wall of the house. So more immersive screen. So imagine that there's a human here, human user, and he's grabbing a controller here. And there are sensors, which is measuring the human movement. And there's an avatar inside of the metaverse area. So he'll be shopping. But even though his actual space is a small, like this, his metaverse space can be limitless. He can have a very big shop or very big office. So actually, So he can he can walk around the shopping area. So the shopping area could be much larger than his actual space. I cannot show the detail of the scenario because of the confidentiality, but we are developing this kind of the metaverse scenario for many uh, type of the location, like a shopping, walking, playing, and even sleeping. So I hope that we can share those kind of the nice visionary product in the future but uh, my time is, time is running out. So thank you for your attention and we are open to collaborate with any anybody or partners. So please contact me using that email. And if you have any further questions, you can do the email or you can use the Q&A session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lee, for enlightening us about living with AI and the metaverse. Our next speaker for today is Dr. Ayman Erba, who is an associate professor at the College of Science and engineering at Hamdan bin Khalifa University. Yes, uh, so I'm, I'm really thankful for the invitation by Dr. Adel and the team of uh, the conference. Uh, today, I would like to talk about uh, pervasive AI uh, for IoT applications. And we will focus uh, on the 
idea of uh, inference, distributed inference as uh, a key enabler for this uh, AI revolution. So to start with, we'll talk about the motivation of uh, pervasive AI. I'm really happy that the presentation uh, before was really pushing on a lot of the sensory application and how it's uh, now demanding and pervasive in nature. Uh, then we'll talk about uh, more focused discussion on distributed inference uh, in two key scenarios. And then we'll uh, briefly conclude uh, our talk. Uh, so if we uh, talk about the IoT market share, uh, the Internet of Things is a thing that was coined by Kevin Ashton from MIT in 1999. Uh, and in the last uh, few years, we have been seeing a huge adoption. Uh, so by 2025, as you see, there will be so many IoT devices uh, that this uh, area will require a lot of our attention now to be prepared for this. Uh, in terms of AI, uh, also AI have seen... Uh, a huge adoption uh, in the last uh, 10 years and it's expected uh, that uh, the use of AI in different types of application uh, will continue whether it's smart city application uh, whether it's uh, the link between uh, metaverse smart city and uh, the use of uh, different types of uh, modes of uh, making decisions uh, to deal with the growing uh, need uh, of uh, IoT systems, uh, the computing infrastructure is also evolving from depending solely on the cloud infrastructure as the main backend uh, to do the data processing, storage, uh, and computation to have uh, now uh, edge fog computing where some of the computation, storage, uh, is done close to the end user to have uh, real-time decision making and to be able to support the growing uh, type of uh, applications uh, and this trend will uh, keep uh, going so if we look at the systems infrastructure to support this now we have uh, billions of these devices uh, sensors, mobile phones, UAVs, uh, uh, cameras, all of these uh, resource limited devices. These resource limited devices are really producing a large amount of data. Uh, they are producing big data at the level of the hours and seconds sometimes. Uh, and what's happening if we take just uh, the old view is to move that whole data to the cloud where it will be stored and processed there. But what you will see very quickly that the network will be affected, so much congestion. Uh, the cloud will be a bottleneck for a lot of these applications. Uh, and uh, the storage is not enough. We have just very limited uh, uh, resources at the core network and at the edge. Uh, the bandwidth also is uh, limited because this will, this new IoT sensors and all of these things will be competing with the existing multimedia and different types of traffic. Uh, these devices are also the ones that are generating the data are uh, limited by a fixed amount of uh, power budget. So energy is a big issue and how to make sure that we don't run out of energy. Also the privacy of the data, of everything travels all the way to the cloud. So in the network and at the cloud site, uh, if you have the raw data there, then you run into privacy uh, issues. So what has been happening lately is the proposal of infrastructure provider, telecom provider, cloud providers of what's called edge uh, computing. Uh, so now IoT devices uh, will be connected to the closest edge device. And within that edge device, there will be some computation, uh, some AI 
uh, and some decision making happening uh, and not all the data that is generated by these devices will be transferred all the way up to the cloud uh, only a summary or maybe some decisions or maybe some of the critical data that is there will move up uh, so the application will be split across the cloud, uh, the edge. Uh, so this addresses scalability uh, because not all the data will be communicated, uh, not all the data will be stored, only critical data. Uh, the bandwidth also will be reduced. This traffic will only live in the local uh, close vicinity and then only the summary or some of the data will move up the devices also, instead of using uh, uh, communication over the wide area, they will use local protocols to communicate with the edge. Uh, also the privacy, because uh, the data will only be seen by an edge, which is uh, supposedly more trusted uh, than uh, the cloud, uh, uh, and it's more localized, so the data will not flow uh, which will reduce the vulnerability. However, this is a new infrastructure. This is something that does not exist as of now. So there's a lot of issues with the uh, deployment. Uh, a lot of uh, the providers we know about are testing these edge uh, computing systems, So and they have to provision it and make sure that this infrastructure is available and it's well utilized to justify the uh, investment. Uh, there's also, uh, even though edges are good, they are closer, they make decisions faster, but they are also limited. Sometimes at the peak or when you have big events or something that changes the distribution of things from the average, you run into limitation in terms of the resources. So what we are proposing and what we are seeing other people are considering is to really uh, instead of depending only on edge uh, infrastructure, uh, we are considering uh, to use the existing fabric of IoT devices, uh, resource limited devices. We already have sensors, cameras, UAVs, mobile devices, smartwatch. All of these exist and we can utilize the little resources they have by splitting these problems into smaller problems. And this will help us because uh, it can take uh, some of the load from the edge and from the cloud, no deployment complexity issue because these devices are already existing, uh, no need for new infrastructure, but they are very limited devices. So now we have to find and build a fabric on top of these devices uh, to allow computation to be distributed and to allow storage to be distributed uh, in this uh, new and complex uh, environment. And we really have to study carefully the trade-off between communication versus uh, computation to allow these applications to do as much communication as possible and utilize communication when more devices uh, need, are needed. So this area of pervasive edge computing is uh, really concerned with how to smartly distribute the task across this fabric, how to deal with communication and computation trade-off uh, in order to maximize uh, uh, uptime, to reduce energy consumption, to reduce delay. Uh, so this new area is what's called pervasive AI. And there's so many applications for pervasive edge computing uh, using AI. So we can clean the data, pre-process it, to compress the data, extract features from this data, uh, do initial decision making, uh, predict the state, uh, do some classification. Uh, also reduce the exposure by ensuring security and privacy and choosing the best uh, network. So there are so many ways that at the edge, you can make sense of the data, reduce it, and provide a good uh, experience. So we looked at this area, the area of pervasive AI, 
and uh, we saw that it has two big domains. One uh, domain, which is a domain that have been studied uh, a lot in the last five years, pervasive learning or pervasive training, where we, instead of moving all the data to the cloud and training there, we do the learning uh, in a distributed fashion uh, using federated learning, uh, or using multi-agent reinforcement learning, observing the data in real time, uh, sending the model close to the data, training, and then aggregating and averaging these uh, models. And we had a lot of scenarios where we studied this in healthcare and smart city application. Uh, and in those cases, uh, the data that is there is used to learn uh, the policies to learn the models that are then used to do the inference. And then when we have a model, uh, a model that is trained, uh, then we can see how can this model now be executed at the edge, at those resource limited devices, and how do we distribute this model? Do we put each layer of this neural network in a device? Do we break it into even smaller things like segments? where each segment is run on a device and you can do more things uh, in parallel. And in that domain, we studied uh, privacy uh, and mobility as uh, two key things. And in my talk, I will briefly go over uh, some of these uh, challenges and how at a high level we address them through also utilizing AI and reinforcement uh, learning. So the focus for the next few parts is the distributed inference. So if you look at some application like, like nanorobots, where these mini, very small, tiny robots are there to do drug delivery or to do diagnosis with, with the very tiny sensors, you can see that uh, if we have thousands of these uh, uh, little robots in our bloodstream and we can program them and equip them with AI techniques to detect the damaged cells or to do something which require uh, collective intelligence, then there's a lot of communication, computation, and resource uh, limitation. Also, if you look at uh, smart city applications, uh, uh, for example, smart uh, transportation systems, uh, where you see the cars, the roadside units, uh, the, the people with their devices, uh, the cameras, the radars uh, that are used to monitor traffic. Uh, you can see that uh, by enabling these uh, units to do edge intelligence, we can avoid accidents, we can uh, optimize uh, traffic, uh, we can uh, share information to help people make uh, the right decisions uh, and overall improve the experiences of uh, traveling uh, across different types of uh, transport systems, car, trains, uh, buses. And if we look at, for example, uh, robots, uh, particularly in this case, flying intelligent drones, and you can see that these drones now have a specific mission, but they might have a dynamic condition like wind, like other things. And they might be asked in real time to do specific commands and they need to adapt. Uh, you can see very easily why sometimes doing uh, distributed uh, inference across multiple drones, which are very resource limited, will be of uh, great uh, value to achieve uh, ambitious uh, mission. So if we look now uh, at our scenario, a smart city scenario, uh, and we have this task of uh, image processing, uh, let's say surveillance, and we have a neural network that is already trained. And now we want to deploy this neural network, not on one device, but on a number of devices, because these uh, neural networks that are well tested are huge. Like, for example, if we look at uh, VGG, which is a common neural network, it has uh, 50 million neurons, 144 million parameters, 3.4 billion connections. And it's a very well-tested, very state-of-the-art neural network. Can we run it on these devices? Can we deploy it on these mobile, energy-limited uh, devices? And the answer is it's possible, but we need to understand uh, first of all, what type of uh, 
far collaboration is needed. Is it uh, very simple, like binary offloading? We offload the whole neural network to the back end, send the data there, the old model. Is it somewhere in between where we split the model into half or into two parts, one part in the cloud, one part on the edge? Is it uh, hierarchical partitioning uh, at the device, in the edge and in the cloud, where the intermediary data now is moved across uh, device to edge, edge to cloud, or what we are proposing, which is localized collaboration, peer-to-peer -peer collaboration across uh, devices at the fabric at the lowest level, and then whatever comes out can be uh, shared with uh, the cloud. Uh, we also need to understand the deep uh, learning models, uh, multi-layer perceptron, uh, where it's uh, distributed a cyclic graph, uh, convolution neural networks, where you have this uh, pooling and these ideas, uh, or residual neural network, where we have these residual blocks, uh, skipping connection moving, or we have some of these uh, specialized uh, neural networks that are uh, randomly wired. And for each type of neural network, we have to consider what are our constraints here? What are our advantages? Is it easy to distribute? Is the technique of distribution uh, different based on the architecture? Also the strategy of distribution. Uh, we can do per layer where each layer lives in one device or multiple layer. So the data starts in one device maybe the capturing device of the image, then it's moving to another device to do the middle layer, then an end device to do the final calculation. Uh, or you can break this model into smaller things that can run in parallel. So you can engage more than one device in each layer, and then you can do things in parallel and break it, uh, and you have a pair segment distribution and which one would be best with which uh, neural network and in which application scenario with specific data depending. So all of this needs to be in the mind of an engineer that is uh, trying to decide on the best strategy of uh, distribution. So if I talk to you very briefly about our first piece of work, uh, where we looked at how to optimally distribute machine learning model among these uh, IoT devices. Uh, and our goal there is to minimize latency uh, and also to respect the resource limitation in the IoT device. And resources are the typical computation, memory, energy, while also ensuring that these untrusted devices in our IoT scenario are not able to reverse engineer the data from the little amount of computation that they get. So this is uh, what we are about to do. And we looked at previous work. Some people uh, propose cryptography, which is very secure, but computationally prohibitive. Uh, some people propose to extract few features, uh, which is uh, computationally very good, but uh, might have uh, issues in the accuracy. Uh, some people propo proposed uh, using uh, trusted uh, uh, layer, and uh, this is definitely better for privacy, but it might not be available in all our uh, typical IoT devices. Uh, so our approach now is to use resource allocation to deploy different parts of the neural network on different devices in order to reduce uh, the privacy concern, so not each device will have a little part of the puzzle and uh, you will engage more devices and uh, these devices will be able to do the work in parallel, which reduces the load on everybody. So we did, uh, we tested with an AI type of attack where a node uh, getting part of the image will try to deduce the full image. We were able to estimate the data leakage by using the structure similarity index, which is an image uh, similarity metric to show whether the image that was predicted is similar to the original image. And we got two big insights. If we do the distribution deep in the neural network, we usually are able to use fewer devices and the attack is chance is very small. And uh, the second insight we got that if we do 
uh, the distribution across many IoT devices, uh, then also uh, the amount of data available for each device is very limited, so they cannot also deduce. So using those two uh, parameters, we are now able to decide, and we decided that similarity of 0.4 is what is acceptable. So based on these uh, insights, we were able uh, to design uh, an algorithm to respect this. And our algorithm was based on uh, reinforcement, uh, deep reinforcement learning. Uh, we have uh, some state that we capture, which is the model, the layer or segment, and now we are using curl layer distribution, uh, the bandwidth, the resource availability in memory and computation, the privacy level, which can be very high, 0.4, or can be more relaxed uh, based on our application. And then we use reinforcement learning, which looks at the environment, decides on who should handle the data, and then gets a reward based on some of the constraints that are in the system, the resource constraints. And uh, based on this reward, I can do more action and I learn as I go. Reinforcement learning is very great uh, because uh, it's a complex problem. There's a lot of devices. The environment has a lot of dynamics. Uh, and the reinforcement learning is great when you have this stochastic nature of the problem. Uh, so in order to use it, we define the actions, who, who will get the data, who will be processing the data, and the state, which I just showed you, you, and then the reward, which incorporates all the constraints in the resources, in the privacy, and ensuring that only one device process a piece of uh, information. And when we tested this, we realized that if the neural network is small, like Linet or maybe Cypher, uh, we can develop uh, smart heuristics similar to what we developed in this work, and it should be fine. But when things become more complex, when you have this heterogeneous scenario, or when you have very deep neural network like VGG, then reinforcement learning can learn the stochastic nature of the problem and have much better uh, lower rejection rate and better uh, latency in general. And now our work is to enhance this by using multi-agent reinforcement learning. So you can have multiple of these uh, IoT systems doing surveillance, uh, collaborating maybe on the resource, uh, uh, on the privacy part, but maybe competing on the resource allocation. And we see some promises there, but the problem is uh, extremely complex. Uh, and then we looked at a scenario where we apply the same ideas, the distributed inference, but in uh, a mobile robot system, um, particularly in a drone scenario. So now we have this uh, mission surveillance also, for example, and we have this neural network. We have much smaller number of devices, these UAVs, uh, and we also uh, decided that maybe in this case, uh, we are not going to do per segment, we will do per layer because we have very few devices uh, and so we cannot distribute across many. And here mobility is a big concern. In the IoT scenario, it was not so hard, but in here mobility is uh, much more uh, serious. So we looked at different mobility models of these devices, uh, homogeneous mobility where they always move along, keep the same distance or non-homogeneous mobility model where they are still having a swarm, but the distance between each two devices change uh, with time. So if we look at the homogeneous case, which is here one, two, and four, you will find overall the distance between devices remain the same across time. While number three here is a case where you have uh, a swarm, but the distance across devices in that swarm changes and since we are using wireless communication in this case this will affect the rate of sending and it will affect how robust uh, our work uh, uh, becomes uh, we developed uh, an optimization in this case to solve uh, the problem of resource allocation uh, and we also uh, used uh, deep learning to predict 
the mobility of the devices up to 10 steps, 10 time units. And we were able uh, with our technique, OULD, OLD, to actually have uh, much better latency. We were able also to get very good latency as the device are moving using our uh, mobility uh, prediction uh, model. Uh, now we are really uh, working to enhance this work. We are looking at different communication models uh, which exhibit different loss and link failures, which exhibit also physical layer uh, properties, and how to design a system uh, that will work across different communication systems, different assumptions. Uh, we also looked at uh, locality. Uh, can we reduce the amount of data that is uh, shared and distributed by assigning the same drone or the same IoT device to do the same task, hopefully with the same type of data? So the model itself is uh, locality aware and maybe the data. Also, we are looking at... Uh, uh, this idea of uh, mobility and how we can incorporate path planning into our optimization uh, and extend it. And we are starting to get very interesting results where we can do distributed inference while also deciding on the mobility decisions of a swarm to ensure that we have some objective function like delay or energy uh, optimized we are also considering, but this is a very complex problem requiring maybe medical expertise, how to do these nanorobots, what type of neural networks that will fit there, and how we are going to work with this very limited resource pool in order to support uh, different applications. Uh, using reinforcement learning techniques, uh, to solve this distributed inference and to solve our distributed training, which we did not talk a lot about today, whether in a centralized or a distributed fashion, is very promising. And we are seeing breakthroughs in terms of performance and reaching our objective, even in hostile environment with very challenging communication techniques. So thank you so much for uh, this. Uh, this work is funded by our grant, by QNRF, uh, and we really thank all of you for listening, and we welcome your questions now. If you don't mind, I have a request more than a question for our panelists here. Um, as you know, the uh, network of the Sun Silk Road it's all about the spirit of the Silk Road in terms of cooperation, coexistence, and uh, what where we can come as individuals, as groups, as countries together to help each other and to promote peace and culture and prosperity. In that sense, I was wondering if uh, both of our uh, panelists here uh, will host during the academic year a couple, uh, let's be it one, two, three, uh, of uh, at the Silk uh, Road Network Universities uh, students, so chosen students from the Silk Road Universities uh, that could benefit for uh, a week or, or two uh, as an internship to see the facilities at LG, to especially those who are in the robotics, in the artificial intelligence, and in fields uh, that are pertaining to what we have seen. And also uh, Qatar uh, is well known and the, 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 the foundation is well known for its research activities for those postgraduate, postdoctorate uh, students in this field to, uh, to, to, to be uh, monitored for a week by this uh, uh, team, and I know a couple of these researchers myself, so that we nurture that cooperation and that uh, uh, network that's, uh, that has been created several uh, hundreds of years ago. So uh, this is a request. Uh, 
Uh, and of course, our doors here in, in Dubai are open also to the uh, Silk Road Network University students uh, to come and spend time here in our facilities with our researchers and our academics. So uh, this is more, we'll as I said, a request than anything else. We will be more than happy actually to start any uh, link and discussion uh, regarding uh, having students here in the College of Science and Engineering or in Qatar Computing Research Institute will be more than happy, Dr. Karim. I'm an, uh, Adam and Karim. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll, we'll follow up on this, uh, I'm together, and get in touch with you on this topic. Yes, for sure. Thank you, Adam. Yeah, for sure. So, Dr. Wong, you, 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 have, uh, you, you, you have already a facility that is open to receive uh, any students from the Silk Road Network to, to go there and visit and uh, get in touch with the, uh, um, the, the, the researchers and see what kind of research they are working on for the next uh, probably 10 mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. You you always amazed me, surprise me, uh, to to suggest their kind of a very innovative ideas. But I wonder if there is a, a LG or Samsung electronic uh, companies uh, located in Dubai area. Indeed, and they will be yeah. also uh, put on this uh, same hot feet of questions oh. uh, and requests. Uh, okay. So today, today I'm directing my request to 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 Korea. We will okay. we will uh, we'll do the same when it comes to the other uh, cities. We do have a subsidiary in Dubai, but uh, uh, we we'll think about it. We we'll think about it. I'm not uh, I'm not in the position of answering the question right right away, but uh, we'll certainly consider the possibility and the, the, yes. that's not a yeah. good idea. Dr. Ayman, I would like to, I mean, ask about the the um, uh, the usability or the usefulness of the fog computing or the usage of the fog computing in the pervasive AI, basically that you have presented right now. Yes. Uh, so that the, the fog computing nodes are, are not there. That power is not basically being exposed to. Do you have any uh, input in that? Uh, what did you notice? I think I could. Oh, not I mean, yeah, you, you talked about the, the edge computing and the cloud computing, yes. but I mean, the fog computing is not there in the solution, basically. Uh, depends what you call. Uh, we generalize all of this uh, uh, processing and uh, communication in this edge idea. Uh, but in this work, particularly, we were focused on the collaboration across the lowest layer, the layer of the devices themselves. Not because we are not going to utilize the edge, but we believe if we manage to fix this problem of working without a coordinator, without then using that layer uh, to complement what the edge or what the fog layer would do, would be a possibility that we can explore. In previous work, we had a hierarchical design where we were using the lowest layer to deal with the, uh, sort of big events or unexpected traffic, while the edge layer was handling the business as usual to complement what the cloud can do. Does this answer your question, Dr. Adil, or maybe I am yes. misinterpreting the, the fog part? I, I, I still believe that the, the fog usually has much higher, let's say, uh, computing power yes. than the edge. So that can be leveraged basically to run the AI I mean, tasks more efficiently if it is well distributed, basically, and coordinated. So that, that was my, my thought. I, I totally agree with you on that in principle. So this work uh, looks uh, at a bit of a pure edge type of approach. But the ideal approach, the more realistic one, is to have this hierarchical where 
the edge can take the extra traffic if any, but if the traffic is known and you distribute the fog uh, computing units in the right way, then you can cover uh, the current needs in an accurate way in a more resource provisioned way. Thank you, thank you. We'll take it later on with more questions. Personally. I ask, ask a, a couple of questions. Uh, to Mr. Chalbeli. And uh, uh, one of my first question, one of uh, my first question is, uh, what kinds of uh, mm, uh, actions that, uh, or what kinds of, what is the most important uh, uh, changes that we have to prepare for the age of AI? Uh, what kinds of revolution should should occur uh, within or, or outside of uh, a higher education or education as a whole? And second question is: uh, uh, I'm very interested in cooking usually, and do you have some kind of uh, uh, plan to uh, develop cooking robotics and so on? And final question is uh, the, the AI divide, we may call it. Those who will have a good AI robotics will be very uh, in a good position to earn money, to have a better life, and those who are too poor to have their kinds of higher quality uh, of AIs. And final question. I will ask the question at the end of uh, your, 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 your answers. Thank you, Professor Wang. We'll leave you three questions. Uh -huh. uh, what we need to prepare. The, it's connected to the, the last question, actually, uh -huh. at the, with the AI divide. Uh -huh. We have a bunch of the AI research, and it's ending up with what kind of profession will be prosperous in the future? What kind of profession right. will be diminishing? And what kind of people will be taking advantage of AI? So, if you remember, the, one of the presidential candidates from the United States insisted on that we need to like a bill the taxes to the high tech companies because they will be taking a lot of jobs and they can they will be taking too much wealth from the society. So, out of that tax income, we need to pay the poor people uh, as the form of the UBI, universal basic income. So somehow because of the coronavirus in Korea, there are very vital discussions about the UBI, the basic incomes, because main shops are closed, many small businesses are closed. So government are paying off their loss and damages. So the people who will be not getting any benefit from the AI, should be comp should be getting some compensation out of the government or, or political party. Okay. Maybe the resource of the money should be the tax for the, those companies who may made the benefit out of the AI. So what kind of preparation preparation we need to make? So we have to be we have to be changing our attitude to be a little bit more AI friendly <laughs> so that we can cope with the, our profession in the future. So rather than just having a single job, many of the AI uh, experts are saying that you will have a multiple small jobs in the future. So maybe we need we need to be more MB experts or, or pi like a person who will have a multi profession or multi expertise. Uh, that, that's the general the saying. And in terms of the cooking things. Uh, for instance, actually, I didn't deal with it, but uh, you know, we, we are very much interested in the display things. So, what I see will be some information. Where I where I see will be the display area. So, many of the cooking aid, for instance, if I'm standing beside of the cooking appliances, maybe some intelligent projector will be mapping the recipe just on top of the appliances so that it can help me to cook better 
rather than just having a cook robot, I, I will, uh, we, we would like to let yourself. people enjoy yeah. the, the happiness of the cooking. That, that's okay. my answer. Okay, the last question is uh, related to the paintings behind you, on the walls of the behind you. It was uh, made by AI robots? No way. The artist is surviving. Okay, this then. Is my, uh, this what is, is your, your uh, prediction or uh, forecasting uh, in terms of uh, the application of AI technologies in drawing, in art? In terms, uh, in terms of the artist things, maybe the artist will be the last profession who will be surviving in, in spite of uh -huh. the uh, AI prosperity. So there will be many drawings or, or the pseudo drawings drawn by AI will be okay. happening and AI designs will be uh, proposed, but uh, the core essence of the art should be human spirit. So I think the art created by the human being will be still prosperous. By the All way, right. this drawing is drawn by my daughter, who's and major daughter. In painting. <laughs> oh, it's wonderful. Thank you very much for you. your, your time yeah. sharing with us. Oh, actually, there's one more question in the Q&A, the box. What is deep learning and how does it relate to the AI? So deep learning is the one of the technology is supporting AI. AI deals with a lot of technologies, including like a voice recognition, the NLP natural language processing, and the virtual human, and etc. So deep learning was the core driver for the Prosperous development of the AI development recently, but still it is one of the those many supporting technologies. I think. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so because of that, it is quite pity that uh, we could not invite uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Jeffrey Hinton for this time. Although uh, Dr. Uh, Karim Chelly has tried to to invite him because of uh, the time lag. Uh, I'm very sorry not to, to write you. Thank you very much for your wonderful time, wonderful presentation. Very interesting. Uh, Professor Huang, I, I, I might have a, a suggestion basically and to uh, child baby as well for the cooking, I mean, robot basically. Uh -huh. uh, uh -huh. I mean, technology wise, we might use uh, digital twins technology basically to uh, to clone kind of i mean the uh, the big cooks and then um, to inject that uh -huh. knowledge inside robots so that we be do the cooking basically live well, that's an idea that can be explored in, uh, <laughs> we definitely well. explore that idea as well <laughs> we are creating like a special coffee machine who can which can learn the recipe of the, the coffee master uh -huh. so that would be similar yes. to this. Yeah. Just paste it into the chat. Uh, one very nice uh, startup uh, in Canada that's doing a cooking robot uh, where you put the ingredients and then it uh, it gets a recipe and does the cooking. Uh, there's so much uh, nice work out there, to be honest. Mm. And for AI for Arts, we have a faculty here in HPKU who is using uh, GAN networks to generate art. And, we had very nice uh, exhibitions, uh, and he is actually working with the museum. He's an wow. artist in residence in the museum uh, and generating art uh, for horses and falcons uh, using just a uh, GAN network for that. Uh, very nice discussion, who is the artist and what they are doing. His name is James Shi. He's from Hong Kong, and uh, he's a very nice artist. Hmm. Actually, GAN, the GAN, is the, the core technology of the, the deep learning recently. So it, it's the GAN, may, there are many GANs, but some of the, the fam most famous GAN will be DALI, and uh, it's, <laughs> it's trying to create many of the uh, drawing objects. So, yeah, we're having a fierce discussion on the, the, the generative image things as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for your time and hope to see you all again next week, where we will be having a panel discussion on AI and BD in management of business and wealth. The showcase session for next week is being conducted by the senior vice president of smart stream technologies, Mr. Protesh Kotecha. Thank you all once again and hope to see you all next week. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you.